And good morning, everyone. Welcome to our seminar this morning. It's um, part of our Community Outreach and Engagement Seminar series, and we're delighted today to have Dr. Bichet Zerdoki, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Experimental and Clinical Pharmacology at the University of Minnesota. He earned both his bachelor's and master's degree in clinical pharmacy from Ain Shams University in Egypt. He then moved to the University of Alberta where he earned a PhD in pharmaceutical sciences and subsequently completed a postdoctoral fellowship in the Department of Pediatrics and the Cardiovascular Research Center. He then joined the faculty of the University of Minnesota in 2015. His research is focused on cardio-oncology and the goal of his research is really to mitigate some of the cardiovascular adverse events of anti-cancer agents. Over the course of his faculty career, he's earned numerous awards and also has had several foundation grants to support his research. And recently he received an NIH R01 award to support his work on doxorubicin induced cardiovascular aging. Today, the title of his talk is Two Hit Models to Understand the Mechanisms of Latent Doxorubicin Cardiotoxicity. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Zerdoki. Thank you. Hey, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Pointer, for the introduction. So my talk today will be about the uh, two head mo mouse models to understand a latent doxorubicin cardiotoxicity. Audrey was five years old when she was diagnosed with cancer. Her family was devastated by the news and Audrey had to go through rounds and rounds of chemotherapy. The good news is Audrey won her battle against cancer and now she is a childhood cancer survivor. The chemotherapy saved her life, but unfortunately it also has put her at increased risk for several health conditions including secondary malignancy, cardiovascular diseases, endocrine dysfunction, and even hearing impairment because of her cisplatin therapy. Audrey is not alone. Although the five-year survival rate of children diagnosed with cancer has increased from less than 60% in the 1970 to more than 80% in 2010, which translates to more than 400,000 childhood cancer survivors in the United States. And although this increasing number of survivors is a cause for celebration for everyone, and we, everyone is very happy for Audrey and for every childhood cancer survivor like Audrey, unfortunately, the cumulative incidence of a chronic health condition 30 years after cancer diagnosis is 73% in these cancer survivors. So almost three quarters of these survivors suffer from a chronic health condition. In particular, and to my own uh, scientific and research interest, I'm interested in the adverse cardiovascular complications happening after uh, childhood cancer uh, therapy. And survivors have about 15 times higher risk of heart failure than their siblings, mainly due to delayed cardiotoxicity of cancer treatment. And one specific agent that may be responsible for this increased risk is doxorubicin or adriamycin. 50% of pediatric cancer patients receive anthracyclines. These anthracyclines, although very effective and they definitely contributed to the high rates of survivorship, they are known to cause cardiotoxicity. So they are still extensively used in pediatric cancer patients, although they are known to cause cardiotoxicity. And they have been used for 40 years now, and there is more than 40 years of research into them, but unfortunately, there is still no consensus on either the exact mechanism of cardiotoxicity or the best approach 
to prevent or treat it. Anthracycline-induced cardiotoxicity can be manifested as acute cardiotoxicity, and this happens during or immediately after chemotherapy administration. And this kind of cardiotoxicity is becoming rare now because we know what is the threshold, the threshold of those that at which this cardiotoxicity happens, and usually oncologists do not exceed this uh, threshold. There is also an early onset chronic progressive toxicity. This typically happens within the first year after treatment. And there is also the late and delayed onset chronic progressive cardiotoxicity that happens years to decades after chemotherapy. What are the proposed mechanisms of anthracycline-induced cardiotoxicity? Oxidative stress is one of these mechanisms, and this happens because of the structure, the chemical structure of toxorobicin is prone to producing reactive oxygen species. Cardiomyocyte cell death, specifically apoptotic cell death, but other forms of cell death also occur. Direct mitochondrial damage, and disruption of myocardial energy metabolism. These are among the many mechanisms that have been shown to contribute to doxorubicin-induced cardiotoxicity. Most of these mechanisms have been demonstrated in adult rodent models of acute and early onset chronic progressive cardiotoxicity. The mechanisms of the late and delayed onset chronic progressive cardiotoxicity are much less understood, especially in juvenile mouse models. So most of the studies done in adults, very few in juvenile mouse model, and even those in juvenile mouse models, there are even fewer studies that demonstrated or investigated the mechanisms of late delayed chronic progressive cardiotoxicity. For instance, this mouse model from the uh, Lauren Field Group, it's a model of early onset chronic progressive cardiotoxicity. As you can see here, this is the fractional shortening, a way to uh, present the systolic cardiac function. And they started with mice at two weeks of age. They injected them with uh, five doses of five milligram per kilogram doxorubicin. And after the second dose, they started to see decline in cardiac function, which progressed till seven weeks of age. And even when they measured it later at 19 weeks of age, there was a trend toward improvement, but it still was significantly different from the control group that did not receive doxorubicin. So this is a traditional model of early onset. It happens immediately after the uh, doxorubicin administration, and it's a chronic progressive because it lasted long enough in the uh, life of the mice. And like 19 weeks in, in a life of a mouse is more of like 30 years in human life. So this is a significantly uh, large or large segment of the mouse uh, life. But again, this is a model of chronic progressive cardiotoxicity. So what about another model of chronic cardiotoxicity, which we think may mimic or may model the delayed cardiotoxicity that we see years and decades after the administration of chemotherapy? And we think that a two-head model will faithfully model this delayed anthracycline cardiotoxicity. And the hypothesis behind this model is that low doses of doxorubicin, clinically relevant in the low range of, of the dose, will cause subclinical cardiotoxicity. And the meaning of a subclinical cardiotoxicity is the, the cardiotoxicity that can be discovered by more sophisticated 
uh, imaging techniques or more sophisticated molecular uh, techniques, but they, they are not manifested in clinical symptoms. So like the patient does not come and complain of anything. But then with a second cardiovascular hit, later in the life of the survivor, even in their adulthood life, this may lead to overt cardiomyopathy. In other words, these low dose of doxorubicin predispose the heart to worse outcome when it's challenged by another cardiovascular hit. And this is another representation of this uh, idea, is that when the patient, the pediatric patient, receives the cardiotoxic cancer treatment, it will drop its cardiac function, but still it's in the area of subclinical cardiotoxicity. So it's not real uh, cardiac failure or any symptomatic disease. But later in life, when they are subjected to a second hit, this will deteriorate their cardiac function, leading to overt cardiomyopathy. So the first group that made a model for, for this, a mouse model for this, was the Gustafson group in University of California, San Diego. And as you see here, they administered very low doses of doxorubicin to very young mice. And these mice here at the postnatal day five, postnatal day 10, 15, and 20, and they were administered very, very low doses of doxorubicin. This age from postnatal day five to day 20 represent in human life the first three years of human life, which is not a very common uh, years to have uh, cancer in, in human life. But this was an interesting study that showed that these very low doses of doxorubicin actually did not do anything obvious to the heart. So when they did this, when they examined the heart by uh, histology, you, can, you cannot see any difference. If of this by tunnel assay, there was no difference. Even by electron microscopy, there was no obvious difference between control and doxorubicin treated hearts. So there is no immediate cardiac dysfunction or even pathology. The only thing that they discovered was a reduction in the blood flow to the heart. And as you can see here, this these represent the capillaries inside the heart. And with doxorubicin treatment, the density of these capillaries are reduced. And this is the uh, quantification of the uh, capillary density. You can see here at day 40 and even day 60, there is a significant reduction in the density of the capillaries. And this is also a representation the blue dots represent the uh, CD31 cells or endothelial cells in the heart. And at the molecular level, there is a reduction in the uh, VEGF or vascular endothelial cell growth uh, factor in the heart. So the only thing that they, when they dig the deep to see what's going on in this heart, they found out that there is a modest decline in capillary density. But again, remember this is a two hit model. So the first hit is not expected to do much harm. Now it comes when these hearts or these mice were subjected to a second hit. And within the Gustafson model, the second hit was myocardial infarction. So when they produced myocardial infarction or heart attack in these mice in their adult life, well beyond the uh, dosing of, of doxorubicin 10 weeks after the last dose, they found out that first of all, there was a significant mortality difference between uh, these mice 
which received doxorubicin and controlled mice after uh, inducing myocardial infarction. The infarct size much bigger in doxorubicin uh, treated mice. The area at risk was higher in doxorubicin treated mice and fibrosis happened more in doxorubicin treated heart. So although the initial insult was not very obvious to induce harm, it definitely predisposed the hearts to myocardial infarction later in life. Not only myocardial infarction, the Gustafson group pre exposed these mice later in their adulthood life to exercise, which is, you think it's something good to happen, but this was a very uh, vigorous uh, form of exercise, swimming for two um, hours twice a day, which is a significant exercise and significant burden on the heart for these mice. And as you can see here, the doxorubicin treated mice showed some hypertrophy when they were exercising. And this is even more obvious with the fibrosis in the heart. So the, the blue uh, color, color here represents uh, fibrous tissue uh, as stained by trichrome stain. And it's definitely here with doxorubicin alone, there is no much uh, blue, but here, doxorubicin and exercise, there was a lot of blue staining, meaning that there is a lot of fibrosis. Also, cardiac function was different in the saline group after exercise and doxorubicin group. So with the Gustafson model, they showed that very low doses of doxorubicin at young age really predisposed the heart to damaging effects of two insults. The first was myocardial infarction and the second was exercise. Then in my last year of my uh, postdoctoral uh, fellowship with uh, Jason Dyke at the University of Alberta Cardiovascular Research Center, I thought to start another two-hit model for latent doxorubicin cardiotoxicity. But at this model, we started with young mice, but not very young. So we started with mice at five weeks of age, which is 10 years uh, in human uh, life. And we thought that, and we still think that this age is more uh, relevant to pediatric cancers than the like one year, uh, the very young mice used by the Gustafson group which happened, some cancers happen at this very, very young age, but not as uh, frequent. So we started with five week uh, old C57 DL6 mice. We administered doxorubicin at also relatively low dose, four milligram per kilogram per week. And this is equivalent to 40 milligram per meter square in human and definitely something that we see in pediatric uh, patients three doses, and then we wait for five weeks, which is equivalent to 10 years in human life, and we subject these mice to another cardiovascular hit in their adulthood. The first cardiovascular hit was angiotensin II induced hypertension, and we started this uh, project in Alberta. And then another hit was chronic psychosocial stress, which we started this project here in Minnesota. So what does the first hit do? As we uh, designed this model, the first hit was not uh, harmful uh, to show any damage to the mice, so that, the, as you see here, the survival of, of these mice was similar to the control. The mice stopped growing during doxorubicin administration, but then they grew at the same rate as uh, control mice. There was a decline in the heart weight, and this is uh, 
a hallmark of doxorubicin toxicity that it causes cardiac atrophy. But there was no change in ejection fraction and other uh, parameters of cardiac function that we measured in these uh, mice. There was an increase of some molecular markers indicative of cardiotoxicity, like atrial natriuretic to 5 gene expression, and activation of uh, P38 MAP kinase, which is involved in inflammation and in aging or senescence. So again, there is no obvious damage to the heart, but there is some molecular changes indicative of cardiotoxicity. Then we chose hypertension as a second hit because it is the most significant risk factor for heart failure in anthracycline treated childhood cancer survivors. Hypertensive survivors have 12 times higher risk for heart failure than normotensive survivors. So hypertension is really a significant risk factor that worth investigation. So what we did was, after we injected the mice with the three doses of doxorubicin at their young age, and waited for five weeks, then we implanted angiotens and two in many osmotic pumps to these mice to cause hypertension or to elevate their uh, blood pressure. Interestingly, doxorubicin by itself in this dose caused an increase in blood pressure in these mice, which was further increased by angiotensin II as expected. Usually when there is hypertension, the, the load on the heart increases, and this makes the heart undergo adaptive cardiac hypertrophy, so that the heart gets bigger in size. But what happens with doxorubicin treated mice, their hearts do not get bigger when they were administered angiotensin II. So first of all, doxorubicin administration prevented this adaptive cardiac hypertrophy that should have happened with angiotensin II. And this brought us to, okay, there's something happening here. When we measured the cardiac function in these mice, we found out that neither doxorubicin nor angiotensin II alone were sufficient to reduce the cardiac function, but when they were combined together, there was a reduction in cardiac function as manifested by a reduction in ejection fraction and even further reduction in cardiac output. This was also associated with a significant synergistic effect between doxorubicin and angiotensin II at molecular markers of cardiotoxicity like atrial natriuretic peptide and markers of inflammation like interleukin-6. We measured other things and all like cyclooxygenase 2 and, and interleukin-1 beta and a bunch of other things. And all of them were synergistically increased when the hearts were exposed to doxorubicin first and then hit with angiotensin 2 in adult life of the mice. Recently, we did the histopathology analysis of these hearts. And as you can see here, doxorubicin alone and angiotensin II alone cause a modest fibrosis. But when they, these two hits were combined together, you can see very significant fibrosis happening in these hearts. And also as a molecular marker, we measured the gene expression of collagen 1A1. And as you can see here, doxorubicin plus angiotensin II caused a significant increase in this molecular marker. The other second hit that I started here at the University of Minnesota, and this was uh, as a piece of advice from uh, Dr. Sue Everson Rose during one of my uh, CTSI uh, mentoring sessions, and I'm, I'm grateful to the CTSI for this and for, for Dr. Everson Rose. So she gave me the idea 
What about psychosocial stress? So I presented the model of energy fencing too, and then she uh, told me that what about psychosocial stress? Because, uh, you know, she is interested in the uh, effects of psychosocial stress of the cardiovascular system uh, in, in human data. So I, I told her, yeah, probably we can try this. I, I don't know how. But definitely psychosocial stress is a significant risk factor for cardiovascular disease, and it's an enormous burden in childhood cancer survivors. And there are some observational studies that suggesting psychosocial stress is associated with uh, cardiomyopathy onset in cancer survivors. But how can I do that? I have no idea how to make mice uh, stressed or how to it's easy for angiotensin 2 to just inject angiotensin 2 in the mice, and it's a chemical uh, mediator of the hypertension, but how to uh, under, make mice undergo psychosocial stress. And then I got introduced to Dr. Alessandro Bartolomucci from the Department of Integrative uh, Biology and Physiology, who has this very intriguing uh, mouse model of psychosocial stress. So it's an intruder mouse model. So they have the C57BL6 uh, mice, and then they have a CD1, which is a more aggressive uh, mouse. And then they introduce the C57BL6 into the territory of the CD1 uh, aggressive mouse. And when a new mouse is introduced to the uh, territory of an aggressive mouse, the aggressive mouse started to bully the, the intruder mouse. They let this bullying happen for 10 minutes and then they separate the mice so that no physical harm uh, is done. And then they repeat this cycle for 14 days. So every day for 14 days, the two mice interact with each other. The aggressive CD1 white uh, mouse start bullying the C57 a BL6 mouse until a social hierarchy uh, happens and CD1 uh, mouse becomes the dominant mouse and the, CD, uh, the C57 BL6 mouse becomes the uh, subordinate uh, mouse. And this cycle goes on and on for 14 days. And this model is an established model in the field of psychosocial stress and it's, no, it's known to model a lot of parameters in, in human psychosocial uh, stress uh, behavior. I'm definitely very thankful for the Bartolomucci group who helped us a lot with establishing this model in combination of our Dux Robeson model. So now we have the two hit model with Dux Robeson in the young age, five week recovery period, and then psychosocial stress for uh, two weeks, starting from the 12 weeks of age till the 14 weeks of age. So these results are from the DOPS stress two hit model. And similar to the angiotensin two model, there was stress caused cardiac hypertrophy or enlargement of the heart, which was prevented by doxorubicin. So again, this effect on, on cardiac atrophy or prevention of adaptive uh, hypertrophy was similar between angiotensin 2 and stress as second hits. But with the stress, there was no change in cardiac function. So cardiac output was similar in all groups of mice, both control stress, uh, those uh, received doxorubicin and those did not receive doxorubicin similar ejection fraction did not change. There was a synergistic damaging effect or uh, detrimental effect on molecular markers of cardiotoxicity like atrial natriuretic peptide, inflammatory markers like interleukin-6 and cyclooxygenase-2. So there is more inflammation happening in, in the hearts which were predisposed to doxorubicin or pre-exposed to doxorubicin and then exposed to uh, stress. And this resulted in more fibrosis 
and the docs stress might. As you can see here, control, stress, doxorubicin did not do much uh, fibrosis on the heart, but when the two hits are combined in the docs stress mice, there is significant fibrosis. And an observation that we wanted to follow on is that most of the fibrosis that's happening were uh, perivascular. So it's around the blood vessels, much more than uh, interstitial uh, fibrosis. And this is quantification of the fibrosis, and this is a uh, molecular marker indicative of fibrosis, which is collagen 1A1. And again, as you can see here, uh, there is a combined additive or synergistic effect between doxorubicin and stress. So as an interim conclusion here, low doxorubicin doses cause latent cardiotoxicity, predisposing the mice to overt cardiomyopathy when challenged by a second about onset cardiovascular hit. And this was uh, obvious in two, uh, in two models, the Gustafsson model and uh, our model, and with multiple uh, second hits, myocardial infarction, exercise, angiotensin II induced hypertension, and a psychosocial stress with definitely some uh, differences between uh, and some specific differences between each uh, second hit. But the overall idea is there that if you administer low doses of doxorubicin at young age, even if they do not do immediate cardiac dysfunction, they still predispose the heart to a later uh, cardiovascular. Now there are two questions that arise. Can we protect against these delayed detrimental effects? And what is the mechanism or what are the mechanisms of this latent cardiotoxicity? The first question was answered by a continuation of, of the study that I was uh, initially performing, the uh, doxorubicin and angiotensin II model in uh, University of Alberta. And when I uh, left Alberta and, and became here and, come, and came here, a talented cardiologist from originally from Japan, uh, Nobu Matsumura, he took over this study and, and tried to answer the first question which is, can we protect against the, this delayed cardiotoxicity? Uh, and my uh, postdoctoral mentor, Dr. Uh, Jason Dyke from University of Alberta, was very interested in this uh, molecule, resveratrol. Resveratrol is a polyphenolic compound originally uh, discovered and extracted from uh, red grapes and red wine, but now is available as uh, a nutraceutical, so it's like a food additive or a food supplement. And he usually like thinks that resveratrol is is cure for for everything. So he definitely tried resveratrol in this and this model. So what we did, or what Nubu did, is they treated uh, mice with doxorubicin, again four milligram per kilogram, uh, along with uh, resveratrol in diet. So they mix resveratrol with, with diet so that the mice take uh, constant amount of resveratrol every day while they are eating. And we the first question we asked whether resveratrol will protect against the early uh, toxic effects of doxorubicin. We, we kind of know that it will protect against the early toxic effects of doxorubicin because uh, we and others have shown the protective effect of resveratrol against doxorubicin toxicity in, in different models. So this was kind of expected that resveratrol will protect against the first head. So it prevented cardiac atrophy and it reduced uh, the elevated blood pressure by doxorubicin and it also ab abrogated the induction or the activation of uh, P38 MAP kinase. So at the molecular levels, it reverses what uh, doxorubicin did. 
And the real question was, can this protection be carried forward so that it also protects against the damaging effect of the second hit? And this was a very critical question. So we treated doxorubicin, we, we treated the mice with doxorubicin plus or minus resveratrol one week before the first dose and one week after the last dose. Resveratrol was stopped and the, for four weeks, the mice did not receive anything, neither doxorubicin nor resveratrol. And then they were all exposed to angiotensin two. And for our pleasant surprise, resveratrol protection was carried forward to even provide protection against the second hit. So as you can see here, resveratrol treated mice, there is no increase in systolic blood pressure as compared to doxorubicin treated mice. So it kind of abrogated or abolished the detrimental effect of doxorubicin. The hearts, the hearts start to get bigger again with angiotensin II. So now the hearts re restored the, their hypertrophic capabilities. And more importantly, the cardiac output is reserved. So the cardiac output went up again with resveratrol. When I started here, there was an important question to answer. Whether this dose of resveratrol, and I got a question about what is the optimal dose of resveratrol. So we are using, uh, mixing resveratrol in diet with a 0.4%, so 0.4% of the diet is resveratrol. And this dose has been optimized in my uh, postdoctoral mentor lab for, for years. And it's known to reduce cardiac hypertrophy, reduce blood pressure, have a good effects on, on the heart in, in different models. But my question was, whether this dose of resveratrol, which we demonstrate that it protects the heart, what's its effect on the tumor? Because in, in cardio-oncology or in, in mouse models of uh, protection against chemotherapy-induced toxicity, you do not need to compromise the chemotherapeutic benefit of the drug. So that we did a tumor bearing uh, mouse model in consultation with the Lardispada uh, laboratory. And in our pilot study, we have four uh, mice treated with doxorubicin, four mice treated with doxorubicin plus resveratrol, and there was no change in tumor growth. So in our pilot study, thus far, we demonstrate that this dose of resveratrol, which was cardioprotective, does not affect the, uh, or does not compromise the chemotherapeutic benefit of uh, doxorubicin. Then we got the question by the reviewers when we uh, published this paper is, resveratrol protects against doxorubicin and retensin two effects. What is the mechanism? And because resveratrol has multiple effects, we did an um, RNA sequencing study of, of the myocardial tissues. And what was very significant is that resveratrol protects against or prevented the upregulation of senescence markers. As you can see here, doxorubicin when combined with angiotensin II caused a significant, very, very marked increase in multiple senescence markers by P21. And these were all downregulated by resveratrol. So this was one of the suggestion it might be through prevention of uh, cardiovascular aging. And again, there was an editorial written on this publication, which brought my own attention into the area of cellular senescence. And they suggested that this is because of the anti-aging properties of uh, resveratrol. So what's therapy-induced senescence and how it may be important in this? Can cancer therapy 
including anthracyclines, is known to cause cellular senescence and probably has been very, very known and very investigated in cancer research more than the cardiovascular research through DNA damage, oxidative stress, telomere dysfunction. This recently has been demonstrated in cardiovascular cells as well. And the hypothesis is these cardiovascular cells, when exposed to the uh, anthracyclines or other chemotherapeutic agents or even radiation, they become senescent cardiovascular cells undergoing cell cycle arrest, increasing the expression or the activity of SA beta galactosidase, a marker of senescence, and more importantly, producing a lot of senescence-associated secretory pattern or cells. Mainly inflammatory in nature, interleukin-6, IL-1-beta, TNF-alpha, leading to cardiovascular disease. This has been shown previously in, in hearts of rats. For example, here, the, the blue coloration is the SA-beta-gal, indicating senescence. And in hearts of rats, as you see here, Doxorubicin treatment cause increase in SA beta gal activity. In our model of low dose doxorubicin, the four milligram per kilogram per week for three weeks, induced P21, a marker of senescence, in the heart, kidney, liver, at the gene expression, and at the protein expression level. As you can see here, the induction was most significant in the liver, much more even than the heart. And we could, that's why we confirmed it at protein expression in the, in the liver. We're still doing these experiments at the protein level in the heart and the kidney. It's not only P21. We determined the differences in gene expression of senescence marker of other markers other than P21 in the liver, we found increase in P21, P16, P19, uh, MCP1. So almost all of these markers increase. And this is consistent with uh, the known fact that doxorubicin induces cellular senescence. We also did this in a model of uh, endothelial cell senescence in vitro. And we showed that Luxorobicin induces P53, P21, and SA beta gal in endothelial cells in vitro. I'll skip some slides to get into the conclusions. This is consistent also with the concept that young childhood cancer survivors suffer from cardiovascular diseases typically experienced by aged population. So, as you can see here, this line is for the general population, the rate of cardiovascular disease, and this line is the rate of cardiovascular disease in childhood cancer survivors. And childhood cancer survivors, they look like they age by 15 years. So the curves are shifted 15 years in childhood cancer survivors. So they develop the same rates of cardiovascular diseases as more aged population. So now we I modulated or reformulated our hypothesis to focus on cardiovascular aging. So low dose doxorubicin cause cellular senescence leading to cardiovascular aging that can be prevented by a new group of drugs called senotherapeutics. And this will predispose the heart to a second cardiovascular hit leading to overt cardiomyopathy. This is still a work in progress hypothesis. We just received our uh, funding for, from the NHLDI to uh, test this hypothesis. Hopefully we can get some uh, useful data uh, from this uh, grant. Another piece of information that I wanted to share with you that we used our uh, DOX stress model to test whether one of these senotherapeutics called ABT, whether it can 
prevent this synergistic interaction between doxorubicin and stress. So in this study, we have controlled mice, and then we have doxorubicin, and then stress mice, so the dox stress uh, model. And the ABT, another uh, group of mice were exposed to doxorubicin, and then later exposed to stress. And in between the two stressors, we administered ABT. ABT is a senolytic drug. Senolytic means it should clear the senescent cells from the body of the animal. And here it's position or its timing in between the two hits means that it would kill the, the senescent cells, make the animals free from senescent cells so that it would prevent the compounding effect of stress. And this is a pilot study that we just we did on gene expression, and we found out that adding the ABT to the regimen reversed or corrected the gene expression of atrial natriuretic peptide and inflammatory marker FOX2 and IL6, which may be a good sign that clearing senescent cells may protect these mice from a second cardiovascular hit. So future directions, we are working on these uh, now, confirming the causative relation between dox-induced senescence and its cardiovascular complications. We know that doxorubicin induces senescence, and we know it has cardiovascular complications. Whether there is a causative relationship, this is not yet established. And defining the dox-induced senescence phenotype in different cells within and outside the cardiovascular system, and also identifying the cardiovascular protective effects of uh, different uh, senotherapeutics. For those interested in following up on these uh, preliminary data or on these uh, animal data with future clinical work, I would happy for everyone to get consultation with to move any of these uh, ideas forward to the clinic. Uh, I'm working with uh, Karim Sadak, hopefully to get some of these uh, moving forward to confirm the association between signs of premature aging and adverse cardiovascular outcomes in cancer survivors, identifying blood markers of senescence as potential biomarkers of adverse cardiovascular diseases, and de determine the safety and efficacy of resveratrol and other uh, senotherapeutic drugs as adjunctive therapy to anthracycline in cancer patients. And thank you very much for, for, your, for listening. Uh, thank you for a very big list of collaborators and people who are helping me within the University of Minnesota and my uh, lab members, as you can see here, I only have my uh, lead technician and lab manager and a graduate student. I have an open postdoctoral fellow position to work on this uh, newly funded uh, NIH grant. So if you uh, see yourself capable of helping with these uh, doxorubicin induced cardiotoxicity projects, senescence, uh, some tumor bearing mouse model, it's very collaborative and interdisciplinary projects that, that we are doing, uh, please feel free to uh, send me your uh, CV. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope we have some time for a few questions. Thanks so much. Uh, so there are two ways to ask questions. You can type your question in the Q&A module, and we'll do it that way. Otherwise, the raised hand feature, and we do have a raised hand. I'm going to go ahead and allow Dr. Yi to unmute. Okay, I think I unmuted. Abache, that was really interesting, and I'm asking a question, and obviously, you know, I'm an adult oncologist, and I give doxorubicin to adults. Um, have you ever looked at the other sequence of stress during juvenile mouse development and then subsequent sensitivity to doxorubicin as an adult mouse? So far, this, thank you for the question. Uh, so far, no. We, we only did the stress uh, five weeks after. Uh, the end of the doxorubicin regimen, but it's definitely a very important thing to do the stress along with the doxorubicin treatment because definitely during the, the cancer diagnosis and the cancer treatment going to 
a hospital and all of this, there is a lot of stress going on on the, on the patient and on the family and everyone around, around them. So it was definitely a good idea and we're planning to do some of these um, studies with, with Alessandro to see where the stress is actually combined at the same time with, um, with the cancer treatment. In, in adulthood, in my idea about adulthood cancer, especially breast cancer patients, the two head hypothesis, which was uh, proposed by, by, um, uh, by Dr. Lee, it, it's kind of opposite of that two head hypothesis to what we propose in, in childhood. So they think that the first head would be a cardiovascular disease. So for example, hypertension or stress or uh, whatever the ischemic heart disease, that happens first, and then when breast cancer patients receive anthracycline, anthracycline treatment is the second hit, which definitely again will uh, compound the effect of the, of the first hit. So the two hit hypothesis in adulthood, it can be opposite, not the same concept, but the sequence may be different, like the cardiovascular disease happens first, then the uh, toxicity due to the uh, cardio uh, toxic agent. Right. Thanks. So there is a uh, typed question. If uh, Dr. Yeah, Pointer so, or Dr. Zeroki. Yeah. Yes. So can you explain the difference between drugs that are senolytics versus drugs that cause senescent cells to behave normally and the relative utility of these types of drugs for the purposes described? Thank you. I actually had a, this one. So we have two types of senotherapeutics. The senolytics and this lead to a killing of senescent cells leading to apoptosis of senescent cells and xenomorphics, which make senescent cells behave more uh, normally, probably by inhibiting the CESP. Both are used and both are uh, good ideas. I will concentrate on, on both. The senolytic approach has its own advantage because of that. You do not need to give the senolytic with the chemotherapeutic agent at the same time. And this is usually a fear with oncologists when we tell them like try something like resveratrol or try something that like metformin or any other uh, cardio potentially cardioprotective agent to be used in combination with the chemotherapeutic regimen. The first fear that comes to oncologists' mind is this may compromise or reduce the effect of the chemotherapy. A good thing about synolytic, because they kill already formed senescent cells, the hypothesis or the proposal is that you give the chemotherapy, you achieve your success with cancer treatment, and then you have a survivor now, their body is full of senescent cells, now you give or you administer the synolytics, it will clear these senescent cells at a later time point. Now you have a rejuvenated uh, survivor. This is the, the, the hypothesis or the premise regarding uh, the use of senolytics. They do not need to be administered at the same time as the chemotherapeutic agents. Usually xenomorphics, you need to administer them with the chemotherapeutic agent to prevent or to modulate the xeno. Uh, sen senescence uh, phenotype, and this may or may not affect the uh, chemotherapeutic benefit of, uh, of uh, the chemotherapy. A question arises, which is, I think, a valid question. As you see here, synthetics clear senescent cells by inducing apoptosis. So whether your chemotherapeutic agent, for example, if it induces senescence in endothelial cells, and then you kill these cells. Now, instead of having senescent cells, you have killed the cells. Will, will the body replace these important cells or it will cause permanent damage to the body? So again, this is a question that we are working on. And other models, for example, like natural aging or accelerated genetic models of accelerated aging, the use of synolytics induced apoptosis of senescent cells, leading to a very, very good uh, outcome in most of these uh, models. Uh, we still uh, do not know a definite answer 
uh, for this in uh, our model. I hope this uh, answered this, uh, this question. We have another question. I've uh, allowed Dr. Sadak to unmute. Go ahead. Hi, Bisset, it's Kareem. Thanks for this talk. It's been so wonderful collaborating with you and your lab. You actually <laughs> answered my question just now as you wrapped up your reply to Dr. E's question about the clearance of the apoptotic cells and how that's still to be determined. So I'll just add then as a quick comment, you know, at least in the childhood cancer survivorship care that we deliver, we have so few preventative interventions, interventions that either prevent or reverse the long-term complications of our cancer treatments that we give children. So you know, not only, as you pointed out, is, is this work so clinically relevant, but it really has the potential to fill a critical gap in what we do to treat and cure children with cancer. So um, just great, great work. And um, thanks for all your collaboration with such a clinically relevant and important topic. Thank you, Karim, for your uh, collaboration and your clinical insights into, into these projects. It definitely helped me. Uh, another question is the toxicity mechanism same among anthracyclines. Do you see the same results with other ones such as AP Robeson? The belief is that they usually share the same mechanisms. I have not uh, done any work with other anthracyclines. I usually uh, work with Dexrobeson as the most common one, but the belief they are more or less the same, although there's some literature showing uh, different differences. Uh, but it, it's a good question to ask whether, especially at the senescence level, whether all of them will induce the same uh, severity and the same phenotype of, of senescence. Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Uh, thanks everyone for joining and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you everyone. And thank you the Amazonian Cancer Center for inviting me to this seminar.